Welcome to Stevens Institute of Technology and welcome to our program from Bits to Qubits, a celebration of Claude Shannon, father of the information age. Someone asked me uh, what qubits are or, and I uh, said that they would have to wait to the, to the program. So thankfully I'm not talking about information theory today for my sake and for yours. Um, my name is Beth McGrath. Uh, I'm Vice President for University Relations and also serve as Chief of Staff to the President. Um, it's wonderful to see so many um, friends, uh, students here early on a Saturday morning. Um, great job. Uh, alumni I see, neighbors, uh, I see, understand there's some parents here. Um, we have uh, IEEE uh, representatives as well. Um, and also our friends from uh, the Ivy Plus alumni group. So uh, thank you all for coming. Um, we weren't sure what to expect on a Saturday morning, but we're delighted to have you all here. So um, I have three jobs this morning. Uh, the first is to make sure that folks sit up front and um, so far so good, but let me ask those who are still finding a seat uh, to do so. Um, second, as the person in charge of um, public relations, external affairs for Stevens, uh, I have to take this opportunity to brag a little bit about uh, the very um, impressive rise that this university has been on um, since 2011. And I'll just um, share a few uh, statistics. Um, we've re experienced remarkable growth and improvement in just about every metric uh, that universities track. Um, since 2011 and until the past fall, um, undergraduate applications have increased 294%. Um, enrollment has grown. Undergraduate enrollment alone has increased by 69%. Um, increases also with uh, underserved uh, students and um, first-gen students. Uh, the median SAT T-score of incoming students over that period of time has increased by 156 points. Research awards are up by almost 200%. We've invested more than uh, $500 million in campus infrastructure, including this beautiful building in which you're sitting now, which opened just about two years ago. Um, we have a student success rate of more than 96%. That's students who find a job or uh, are accepted into graduate school within six months of graduation with record high starting salaries and lots, lots more that uh, I could enumerate, but you're here to hear about Claude Shannon. So let me get to my third task. And that is to um, uh, recognize uh, IEEE, uh, specifically the IEEE History Center, who has um, joined us in co-sponsoring this program um, we have a long history of partnership with IEEE, and I really want to um, acknowledge and uh, recognize um, Dr. Marianne Hellriegel, who you'll hear from next, um, for her partnership and, and um, uh, collaboration in this activity. Um, Marianne, uh, Dr. Hellriegel, is uh, the institutional historian and archivist at the IEEE History Center. Uh, she's done extensive work on New Jersey's own Thomas Edison and also served as a faculty member here at Stevens, um, most recently in the fall of 2020, uh, as well as other institutions that you may have heard of, including New Jersey Institute of Technology and several other institutions. We're grateful to Dr. Hellriegel and to the IEEE History Center for partnering with Stevens in this event. After you hear from uh, Dr. Hellriegel, um, President Naraman Prevardin will present the keynote lecture on Claude Shannon, whom he calls the least known genius of our time, followed by a panel discussion um, featuring three of, um, I can say this in this forum, our best faculty members. Professor John Horgan, uh, director of uh, the Center for Science Writings, Dr. Brendan Englott, director of the Stevens Institute for Artificial Artificial Intelligence, and Dr. Igor Pakovsky, professor and researcher in theoretical quantum physics. I encourage you all to, I'm getting choked up about this. Um, <laughs> I encourage you all to um, review all the speakers' bios in the program. 
Um, there'll be question and answers uh, at the end of the program and uh, interactive um, panel discussion. Um, just one note, uh, as you may have noticed, um, we'll be recording this session. Um, the uh, recording will be made available uh, in about a week, and um, we invite you to, uh, to share it with um, your colleagues and friends who couldn't be here. So without further ado, let me invite uh, Dr. Marianne Hellriegel up to the podium. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I think it's on. Okay, I'm a historian, so I have books. But I'll explain this in a moment. I'd like to thank you for inviting me here. And I'm going to briefly start with a survey of what IEEE is. If you want the deck, because I'm not going to read the slides to you, just send me an email, and I'll send you the deck. So let's get started. And some of these uh, pictures, they're, they're, all, all of these pictures are in the uh, talk, so I won't belabor you with that. So what is IEEE? IEEE is an organization that traces its roots to the power engineering people of 1884. And Morton, who Morton Pierce uh, Kitty, was a member of the AIEE. Then we have the radio people. They were founded in 1912. These two merged in 1963 to form what is now the IEEE. Currently, we have 463,000 members scattered around the globe. This is what we do. We have 200 plus publications and 2,000 plus conferences. And those are linked in some way to Shaw, uh, uh, Claude, uh, Claude Shannon, a couple of them. We have very active student branches. We have one on campus here. So quickly moving along the History Center, and I'm just going to pop these in. We were founded in 1980, and we were helping to commemorate the centennial in 1984. Currently, we have oral histories. We have the largest collection of women in computing. We have more than 900 transcripts in the archives. More than 800 are posted on ethw.org. You can look at them for free. Claude Shannon's transcript is up there. We have firsthand histories. We have milestones, which are to commemorate a technological event, 25 years plus. We have an archives. We have an outgoing education program. We now have pre-K. Uh, I've taught pre-K with the Apollo that was an interesting day, the Apollo moon landing. But we focus mostly on high school, and that's the REACH program. So Claude Shannon and, and uh, Professor uh, talk about him. He has a background in mathematics, and he has a background in, in uh, uh, computers, uh, EE. And so depending on what department you would be in, but he's at that cross section of radio and electronics and so sometimes in your math, sometimes you're in EE, and eventually you're in computer science. Now, one of his first, if not his first publication, is in the Transactions of the American Institute of Electrical Engineers, which is in uh, 1938. He published mostly in the IRE, the Institute of Radio Engineers Proceedings and such. And he's most well known for his article that he published it with the Bell system. So, What's the link? Now, he is a member of the IRE, an early member. I'm still trying to track that down. He is associated, his technology is associated with many of our 39 technical societies. These are the four that he's most closely related to. Info theory, signal processing, communications, and computers. And when we look at this, 1951 is the founding of Information Theory Society. So is it a coincidence? I don't know. Is he one of the founding members? Not really. Did he kick it off technologically? Yes. So these are some of his early publications with the AIE and IRE. And if you have IEEE Explore, you could go through 
and you, you do have a link with the library here, you could find them. Now, this is a book, and then I brought it with me because I feel compelled to carry heavy things. Uh, 1993, IEEE, and this is uh, uh, Sloan and, and uh, Winner, and they brought all of his writings together in one volume, which sells for uh, about $300 these days. But I got this for free at work. And it's really cool because everything is here, and I'm a book paper person, not an internet person. So this is uh, one of the biggest contributions I think IEEE has made to the continued legacy. OK. And uh, these are the people, uh, Sloan and, and Winner put this together. And it's really well organized. And you can go through and find things that you didn't expect to find from him. And the genetics part is really cool and probably not one that you heard much about, and I won't belabor that, but it's a good read. Now, the communications magazine for the 50th anniversary of, of the technology, a lot of the societies put out magazines, journals, proceedings of conferences. And so it's really cool to mark the historical events when they put out a special magazine devoted to it, and this is one of them, marking back to that 1949. OK. Spectrum. You maybe heard of uh, uh, John Horgan. But Spectrum is a popular magazine put out by IEEE, has many popular articles. And this is his. And um, there was a correction made. And I have to correct mine, 229. It was a long day yesterday. But if, and these are for free. You don't need IEEE Explore. OK. Conferences and symposiums. And this is the one that's most closely related to uh, Claude Shannon and this Information Theory Society's keynote event every year is the International Symposium on Information Theory. And then ICASP is the International Conference on Speech and Signal Processing is another one directly associated with him. And then, of course, we have the Computer Society, which puts out many publications. And this one is for a more popular audience, but computer pro pioneers. And we can then label him a computer pioneer and not just an information theorist. So awards. Now we've got the uh, Claude Shannon Award. And this is the highest award offered by the Information Theory Society. And it's offered annually. And he received it in, in 71. And the person then has to give a lecture. So he gave the lecture in, in 72. And so this is one way. Another one is the Signal Processing Society has a Technical Achievement Award that's named in his honor and, and Harry Nyquist. So we have awards. The Claude Shannon Award, just to make a, a backdrop, it, it's we have one oral history with him. Well, I'll, I'll get to the moment. But to get an award named after you is pretty important. It's, the, it's a technical achievement award. And then to, to name it after him just shows how important he was. And this was done during his lifetime. This is done, you know, 71. And probably came to the board of directors a year or two earlier. And often, you don't like to, the politics of signaling out a person or, or, and such, but that he's so well known that they made a decision that they could name it after him. After all, the, the Alexander Graham Bell, the Edison Medal, or IEEE, but these are offered by the society, so they are his direct peers that singled him out. And then Sloan, the author of, uh, the editor of this book, received the award in 98 five years after the book, but he's well known in the field. And so it just shows you that IEEE members in the field, they present at conferences, and then they get to be editors of proceedings of the conference. And so this is really atypical to put together you know, a nearly 1,000-page book. And then we have timelines, because it's easier, though, not to do it technologically. But the uh, timeline, and you could see that he has the 48 the article, and this is good for if you have any students, maybe fifth grade and above, they can go to ETHW, and there's a lot of information there for free. It's uh, our version of Wikipedia, and you could see the timeline. Now, 
IEEE has its milestones. We now have about 225, 235 in the process. And this is 162, and it's dedicated in 216. I was at that dedication in, uh, at MIT. And this is for an, a technological advance 25 years or older. And you get the bronze plaque and, and such. But this is atypical in that it has Claude Shannon's name in it. Most of these plaques and, and events that are marked don't have a person's name in it because how do you single out who is going to be the person? But clearly, he's seen as the founder of information theory, so it was acceptable to put him on this plaque. And so his oral history, and I'll wrap up in a minute. This is an oral history that was recorded in 1982, and then it was deeded over. We got the IP uh, a number of years later, but... I have the transcript of it, and you could read about it online. And what I found interesting here, reviewing it again, that he received an honor from the IRE around 1950, so clearly just after his grand publications. And so he receives the IRE's uh, most important award, except one, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, these are some of the oral histories that I've recorded with Signal Processing Society directly associated with him. And Bishnu Attell is really interesting. He's a gentleman from India, and he uh, talked about going up and talking to people at MIT, and they're like, well, I want to study with him. And at some point, they're like, well, he doesn't come to the office much, and he doesn't have too many graduate students. But he created a cadre of faculty there that then took on these people. So MIT becomes a node of info theory at signal processing. And Andrea Goldsmith, who's the Dean of Engineering at Princeton and one of the leaders of the 5G, the, when I, 5G, I'm like, I, I live in the 19th century, I do power energy. And fifth generation, okay, it makes sense to me. And so these are some of the voices that we've captured. Okay, and then uh, we've got the uh, Kelly Award. Uh, Claude Shannon is the 1962 recipient. And these are, I came across this photo at the MIT Museum. And so I thought it was pretty cool to have three of the big fish together. And then we have a popular book, and the History Committee of IEEE gave it the Middleton Prize. And then Information Theory helped fund the documentary that's uh, the bit player. There's a bootleg copy on um, YouTube. So just punch in bit player, and it shows up. And it's a really uh, nice documentary in that I, I think it's pretty authentic. It has real actors who aren't too phony. But it also is made for the general public. And given his activities and juggling and all that, I think he would have been proud of that. And then he receives the Medal of Honor in 1966, which is the highest award given by IEEE. And so this is... Um, the, the highest award since 63, but it, it traces its roots back to the IRE. And then this is the same time. And 66 seems to be a big time. He's getting a lot of awards. And then if you have any questions, chickens do cross the road. Uh, yeah, I like to end with that. And this is my archive. The back wall are the oral histories. Uh, they go from big tapes to, to digital now. And... Uh, I'll leave it at that. So we do awards, we do publications, we do conferences, and there are a lot of fans of Claude Shannon. Thank you. Well, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted uh, to have this opportunity to uh, speak with you for a few minutes. I'd like to start by thanking uh, Marianne for uh, this wonderful presentation. Uh, it was quick, but it gave you a an overview of Shannon and his accomplishments. And uh, <clears throat> I also want to thank the IEEE History Center for all its support. Uh, it is nice that you've taken time from your Saturday morning to come here, learn about Claude Shannon, and celebrate his accomplishments. I appreciate it very much. I feel compelled to give you a little story about uh, the genesis of this uh, presentation. It was about a year ago <clears throat> that in this very room, 
we hosted a group of alumni from Ivy Plus universities. <clears throat> they were here to visit uh, a laboratory at Stevens. And uh, if I remember correctly, there were alumni, uh, these are local alumni from MIT, Harvard, uh, Cornell, Dartmouth, uh, Yale, and maybe a couple of other universities. And a gentleman who I think was responsible for putting that event together, who is actually sitting here uh, today, right there, Mr. Phil Rosenbach, um, and I got to uh, say hello to each other. I think I was sitting at the same table uh, <clears throat> with him. And uh, after a brief introduction, he learned that I'm an electrical engineer. And he asked me about uh, you know, the specialty within electrical engineering in which uh, I've done my work, and I told him the broad area of information theory, communications, and he said, uh, how familiar are you with Claude Shannon's work? And uh, I happened to be quite familiar because, uh, you know, I had done my PhD dissertation in that area, and I had done research in that broad field for several decades, so, and I was very, uh, <clears throat> Uh, proud of my association with the uh, work that Claude Shannon had done. So I proudly said, yes, I, uh, I know of Claude Shannon and I'm familiar with his work. And uh, he proceeded to ask whether it would be possible for me to give a presentation about the work of Claude Shannon to a general audience. I think that was the term. And I made the stupid mistake of accepting to do this on the fly. Uh, Mr. Rosenbach uh, was uh, very persistent. He followed up and he said, are you really serious about the promise that you made? And of course, uh, I had no choice at that point to say, yes, uh, I am. Uh, Vice President McGrath followed up and here we are today, uh, <clears throat> me giving a talk that I promised to give about a year ago. And I must say my heart is palpitating much uh, faster than it normally does because uh, the work of Claude Shannon was an earth-shattering scientific contribution. And to summarize that to a broad audience over a period of uh, 45 minutes is a non-trivial undertaking. So um, I, I do sincerely hope that you find this talk informative and helpful. Um, uh, if that happens, you should give uh, obviously some credit to Mr. Rosenbach. Uh, but if you are completely confused and uh, totally disappointed uh, about wasting your time, uh, also remember part of the blame goes to him. Uh, I uh, became a college freshman in 1974. And I don't exactly remember the circumstances, but I do remember vividly. And by the way, I've been a member of the IEEE since 1974. This is my... You're a white fellow. I am. I am. Uh, in that first year, somehow, I was introduced to the work of Claude Shannon. I don't remember how, but I do remember vividly. I would go to the, the Department of Electrical Engineering um, had its own library. And in that library, there were collections of papers in areas related to electrical engineering and lots of papers related to Shannon's work. And a freshman would have a difficult time understanding Shannon's work. But somehow, for some reason, I was fascinated by the work that he had done, or by the work that I thought he had done. And I would spend innumerable hours in the library trying to understand what he did. As I became more uh, advanced in my studies and more mature as a person, I continued to become more interested and more knowledgeable about Shannon's work. And then when I became a, a graduate student, I uh, insisted that I wanted to do my uh, graduate work, my PhD dissertation, in the area of information theory. And I have uh, a classmate of mine who can vouch for this. He's, he's sitting here. Uh, <clears throat> so I did my dissertation in uh, an extension of the work that Shannon started in 1959, which we will talk about. And I, I want to share with you a little anecdote before I go to my presentation. Uh, in 1985, I was a, almost a brand new assistant professor. Uh, 
and I attended the IEEE International Symposium on Information Theory, which that year was held in Brighton, England. So please remember, 1985. I'm this young assistant professor, went to the Information Theory Symposium, and when we arrived, we learned that Dr. Claude Shannon is somewhere around. He wasn't supposed to be there. He had just decided to pop in. And obviously, that was the most important development within uh, this community of about 400 really, really brilliant information theorists who had gathered in Brighton, England from all over the world. Everybody was talking about Shannon, and sure enough, Dr. Shannon showed up with his wife, and these dignitaries in information theory, including people like Aaron Weiner and Neil Sloan and the likes of them, they were lining up to get Mr. Shannon's autograph. Of course, I didn't have the courage to do anything like that. I was just too junior a person. But then there was a banquet. And at the banquet, the seats were not assigned. So when they announced that people should go to their tables to have dinner, uh, people just went to this big room that had a lot of brown tables, and so did I, and randomly I had to select the table, and sure enough, the table I selected happened to be the table that Claude Shannon selected 30 seconds later. Mr. Shannon sat right next to me. That was one of the most memorable experiences of my life. So I had an opportunity to spend about two hours, maybe two and a half hours, at the same table with Mr. and Mrs. Shannon, uh, hearing his life stories. And I must tell you, he was a very humble man. And the most memorable story that I remember from the conversation was how proud he was, not of the work that he did in information theory, but of his ingenious, ingenious design of unicycles. He was fascinated by unicycles, and uh, he kept telling us about these different designs of unicycles, and he was intentional about designing unicycles that w were difficult to ride. And he would design a unicycle, he would challenge his grandchildren to learn how to ride the unicycle, and after some time, they would, and at that point, that unicycle is rendered useless as far as Mr. Shannon was concerned. So he would design a new, more difficult unicycle uh, for them to, to learn how to ride. All right, so with that lightness in the beginning of the presentation, let me get down to business and go over my slides. <clears throat> you heard a little bit about the biography of Claude Shannon. He was born in 1916 in Michigan. He died in 2001 after a long battle with Alzheimer's disease at age 85. He uh, completed his undergraduate studies in 1936. Um, you notice that, uh, well, he went to the University of Michigan in 1932. So he was only 16 years old when he graduated from high school. So he was showing signs of, early signs of unusual brilliance uh, when he was a teenager. So he goes to the University of Michigan, majors in electrical engineering and mathematics. And this is very important because you will see uh, how Claude Shannon continued to be a brilliant mathematician whose mathematics had direct applications to problems that were somehow rooted in electrical engineering. <clears throat> So he graduates from the University of Michigan in 1936, goes to MIT. 1937, he completes a master's thesis, which we will talk about in a moment. But it's important to remember that he did his master's thesis work in one year. There are some um, <clears throat> documents that refer to Shannon's master's thesis in 1940. So I actually investigated this. The truth is that he completed the work in 1937. He signed the master's thesis in 1937, but somehow, MIT, I think at that time, because he was pursuing a PhD degree, he was not interested in obtaining his master's degree. So they waited until 1940, and the, um, uh, the document, uh, uh, the master's thesis uh, itself, was signed by the university in 1940. 
but Shannon's signature is 1937. And it's very important to know this because, in fact, the work that he completed in 1937 was published by the uh, IRE in 1938. So I have clear evidence that the work he did for his master's thesis was done in only one year. And it's important because I'm going to come back to this. Um, he then graduated from MIT in 1940. It went to, for a short period of time, in the Institute for Advanced uh, Study in Princeton. And then he, of course, joined uh, Bell Labs in 1941. And he <clears throat> remained affiliated with Bell Labs until 1972. But in 1956, he formally joined the faculty of MIT. <clears throat> uh, another important thing to remember is that Shannon joined Bell Labs which was uh, a mecca of brilliant minds focusing on a variety of problems in the broad area of communications, telephony, uh, cryptography, and the like in the heat of the war. Why is that important? It's important because of the work that he did there. So first, about his master's thesis, his master's thesis which established a relationship between uh, Boolean algebra, the algebra that was developed by George Boole, a very famous mathematician, and circuit switching, became the foundation of modern digital circuit design. Now, we're not going to talk about digital circuit design at all today, but this is one of the most important works of Claude Shannon. And he did all of that in one year. Remember, this was his master's thesis. His master's thesis is referred to as the most important master's thesis written ever by anybody. Signs of brilliance. Then he did a PhD in an area that he completely lost interest in after he graduated from MIT. He did his PhD in establishing a relationship between mathematics and genetics. Remember. Shannon he tries to use his mastery of mathematics to formalize everything that comes his way. It could be circuit design. It could be genetics. It could be design of anti-aircraft fire control systems. It could be um, secret communications. And later on, it could be the foundations of modern digital, digital communications. He did a paper at Bell Labs because at, during the time of the war, the United States was intensely interested in um, enhancing uh, the secrecy of communication. So Shannon was uh, unleashed on this problem. And it's very interesting. I've read some uh, stories that uh, Shannon was uh, uh, not cleared. Uh, but within Bell Labs, there were a number of individuals who had uh, security clearance. They were not able to tell Shannon everything that they knew, but Shannon had to tell them everything that he knew because he was, he was not clear that it was a very interesting dynamic there. Having said that, uh, the work that he did in uh, the mathematical theory of cryptography that it originally was uh, a classified report uh, became the foundation of what is called modern cryptography. So, so far, you've heard two things from me. The work that he did for master's thesis became the foundation for digital circuit design. The work that he did in uh, communication secrecy became the foundation of modern cryptography. OK, but we're not going to talk about these. Shannon also had some very unusual interests. He loved juggling. And not only did he juggle himself, but he had designed multiple machines, multiple gadgets that would mechanically do juggling. And uh, maybe Professor Horgan will talk about some of these things later. He was also into unicycling, as I had mentioned before. And he liked to unicycle while juggling. So I know there are some people here who are from Murray Hill, and there are some others who have visited uh, Bell Laboratories at Murray Hill. You know they have these very, 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 very long corridors. There are multiple stories about Claude Shannon getting on his unicycle at one end of the corridor, juggling all the way to the other end of the corridor. He was, in some ways, at least from our naive perspective, a, an eccentric 
individual also. He also loved to play chess. And of course, if he loved to play chess, he loved to analyze chess. He loved to design computers to play chess. He, would, he loved to analyze the complexity of chess. And uh, in 1949, he actually estimated the complexity of a uh, uh, chess game, which is an astronomically large number, 10 to the 120. I, I'll let you decide how big a number that is. And he also wrote an article on programming a compu computer to play chess. In uh, 1950, he built a uh, mechanical mouse, <clears throat> and, uh, which he called Thesis. And the picture that you see in the middle of the page is a maze uh, that consists of a labyrinth of 25 small squares. Now, this labyrinth can be reconfigured. All he needs to do, um, th th those panels, those vertical panels that you see, they are on pivots. You can, you can turn them. So what this mouse would do, the mouse would move in a certain direction. If it hits a wall, it recognizes that it, there was a sensor there, it recognizes that cannot continue further changes direction and goes forward. If it hits the wall, again, it recognizes that it should not go in that direction until it finds an opening. This mouse would remember each and every wall that it has hit. But the next time that you put the mouse in this maze, the mouse does not make any mistake anymore. It goes straight through this whole thing. The first artificial intelligence machine that was built by anybody. This is in 1950, 74 years ago. He also, in 1961, developed a digital computer using, using uh, electromagnetic relays uh, call, called MIDIVAC. He was also fascinated by Rubik's Cube. And not only does he like to play Rubik's Cube, but he also builds machines to, play, to, to solve the Rubik's Cube. And you see a picture of the Rubik's Cube manipulator. So, I wanted to open a little window into the mind of this genius. Now, we're not going to talk about any of these things. Now, remember, I have been a teacher for a long time. I've been a university professor since 1983, approximately. So this is uh, my 41st year. And I've been a teacher much longer than that. So the main purpose of this gathering is for me to tell you about what I consider Shannon's most dramatic, most profound, and most revolutionary contribution. And that is in the area of information theory. So I'm hoping that you get a little bit of something out of what I'm about to tell you now. So we'll start by repeating the fact that Claude Shannon is the least known genius of our time. Uh, I think Professor Horgan says uh, the ratio of his impact to his reputation is the large, larger than anybody else's, something like that. So <clears throat> remember Shannon did some work in digital circuit design using Boolean algebra. Boolean algebra essentially is about yeses and nos. It's about zeros and ones. Digital circuit design is about zeros and ones. That was his mindset. Then he goes to Bell Labs. <clears throat> He's surrounded by these brilliant engineers and mathematicians during the war, very interested in doing communications better, doing communications more efficiently. And Shannon, with this incredible mind that he has, he's not interested in making improvements. He's completely uninterested in making improvements. He is interested in going to the bottom of the problem and understanding what is the best we can possibly do. All right? So he says in the beginning of his landmark 1948 paper, he says, the fundamental problem of communication is that of reproducing at one point either exactly or approximately a message selected at another point. So this diagram actually describes what Shannon is trying to say. You have a source of information that produces a message that needs to be reproduced at some other point 
which we call the destination. If I take my iPhone and I call somebody, if I call Tom, I am the source. I produce a message here. And if I call you, you will receive it at that end. You're the destination. Now, this will travel the message that I produce here, in this case, my voice. It will travel through a communication channel. In this case, it will travel through an electromagnetic wave. It will go from my phone. It will go to a cell tower. From the cell tower, it may go to another switching center. It may go to another cell tower. And ultimately, it will come to Tom. That medium through which the message travels is called the communication channel. This channel, in almost all real world situations, is a channel that introduces noise. So what you put inside the channel is not exactly what you get out, out of the channel. The channel corrupts the signal. That's the reality of the real world. OK, so somebody gives you a communication channel. Somebody gives you a source. And Shannon says, what is the best I can do with this? This question was really never asked in that form until his landmark paper in 1948 came out. So Shannon asked a few fundamental questions, not exactly in these words, but almost in these words. What information about the source should be transmitted? Should all the information be transmitted? Is some of the information junk and need not be transmitted? How should that information be transmitted? What is the best way to transmit the information from here to here? And then the most fundamental question, under what conditions is it possible to have what he called reliable communication? Reliable communication means under what conditions can you take the output of the source and reproduce it almost perfectly? Almost perfectly. These are the questions that he investigated and answered in 1948. There was one question that he fully understood, but was not able to answer in 1948. And that question is, well, if those conditions for reliable communication are not met, then what is the best I can do? I know reliable communication is not possible, but what is the best I can do? It took him 11 more years. And by the way, I should say, it took the entire scientific community 11 years to even understand his 1948 paper. But by 1959, he answered this question too. If reliable communication is not possible, what is the best I can do? So we're going to try to answer these questions to this very broad audience, to this general audience that Mr. Rosenbach uh, made me invite here. And hopefully, you will find uh, the presentation understandable. So I talked about these two landmark papers, the first one in 1948, the second one in 1959. The paradigm is the same paradigm. You have a source of information. You have a channel that introduces noise. And the output of the source should be reproduced at the destination. So. All of the answers to these questions that we asked in the previous slide can be answered through three fundamental notions. So I'm going to spend the rest of my talk about these three notions. The first one, oops, the first one is what we call the entropy associated with this source. The second one is the capacity associated with this channel. And the third one is some kind of an extension of the notion of source entropy, which I will call source, uh, I will call um, source rate distortion function, and we'll define it in a second. So in rough terms, the entropy of the source is a measure of the information content in the source. Similarly, the capacity of the channel is a mathematical concept that describes the channel's ability to transmit through itself information, but reliably. So let's talk about these three notions. And I've said it before, but I'll be much more emphatic now. 
There's a very important disclaimer here. I'm going to do a lot of hand waving. So if there are mathematicians in the room, don't have a heart attack, okay? On the other hand, uh, it is possible that even the minimal amount of math that I put here is a turnoff to those of you who are not mathematicians, so forgive me for that. But there's going to be a lot of hand waving, a lot of inaccuracy, but there is no inaccuracy in the concepts that I'm translating to. The concepts are very accurate, very precise, very meaningful. For the rest of this presentation, we will assume that the source is producing outputs in discrete time instances. Second one, second two, second three, second four, and so on. So those outputs are called x1, x2, xn. Somehow those outputs are converted into something that go into the channel. We'll talk about that. Let's call them u1, u2, un. At the output of the channel, you get a distorted version of what goes in. You call them v1, v2, and vn. And ultimately, through some mechanism, you convert what you get at the output of the channel into what we call a replica of the source. Ideally, these x hats are exactly the same as x's, but in some cases, they may not be. All right? Let's proceed. Let's talk about the source entropy. The source entropy has this interesting looking mathematical formula in which P is the probability of the source assuming a value X. So you take the probability um, of each possible output of the source, you multiply that by log of one over the probability, okay? You might say, what the hell is this? Why, why is this important at all, okay? For the time being, just take it as a simple mathematical formula. If you know the probability of each possible output of the source, you can compute this number. Uh, very simply, if your source is the toss of a coin, you get either a head or a, or a tail. And let's say the coin is a fair coin, so you get each one of them with probability one half. So in that case, the entropy of the source, H, is one half log of one half plus one half log of one half that becomes exactly one bit. So this is the first instance where, where the notion of the bit enters the picture. In this case, of course, it's trivial because you're, you have a source of information that produces tails or heads only. It's easy to understand. But you can make it a little more complicated. Example two is the toss of a fair dice. You have six sides. So instead of having one half log of one half multiplied by two, here you have one sixth log of one over six multiplied by six. That results in, oops, that results in 2.58 bits. So now you have a different source of information that actually produces more bits every time you toss the dice, as opposed to the coin. You can make it even more interesting, more complicated, uh, maybe a little bit more real world. If you look at uh, the output of a microphone, the output of a microphone is voltage. You can take that voltage, you can sample it in time, maybe 10,000 times a second, and so the output is this red waveform. If you sample it, you get these blue dots, and what you could do further, you could say, I'm going to take the amplitude and divide it into one of 16 different possibilities, from minus eight all the way to plus seven. 16 different possibilities. This is not really a real world example, but I can tell you, do you all know what an MP3 player is? You all have it on your phones, by the way. An MP3 player does exactly that. It takes your music, instead of sampling it 10,000 times a second, it samples it exactly 44,100 times per second. Don't ask me why, but it's sampled. And then each value of the amplitude is converted into one of 64,000 amplitudes, as opposed to just 16 amplitudes. But the concept is exactly the same. So in this case, you can also compute the entropy if you know the probability of each one of those 16 different values, and the entropy is computed using this formula. All right, now, here comes the big result. This is Shannon's first important earth-shattering result. It's called noiseless, or some people call it lossless, source coding theorem. 
And remember, I gave you this formula for the entropy of the source, which was seemingly completely meaningless. There is a tremendous amount of meaning to this. Shannon proved through his ingenious work that for a given source of information with entropy H, it is impossible to represent the source with fewer than H bits. It is just impossible. Doesn't matter how good you are. You can't do it. Furthermore, he proved that there is a way to actually represent the source with a number of bits very close to H, just a tad bigger than H, arbitrarily close to H. This is an incredible result. H, the entropy, is a fundamental limit, below which it's impossible to represent the source, above which it is possible. Now, Shannon didn't say how to do it. He didn't know how to do it. It's like saying that the speed of light is 300,000 kilometers per second, okay? You can't go any faster than that. But how to, get, how to move that fast, something we still don't know. So Shannon said it is possible to take a source with entropy H and represent it with a number of bits very, very, very close to H. But below that, you can't go. So just imagine what kind of window of opportunity Shannon opened for these brilliant minds who are very interested in taking a source and representing it in a very efficient way. And now they know how far they should push. Prior to Shannon, they didn't know. So essentially, in his quest to answering the question of how to send the source output into the destination, the first step is, Shannon said, let's take the source and let's put it into what he called a lossless or a noiseless source encoder. This source encoder is able to take the output of the source and represent it by a number of bits very close to the entropy of that source. At that point, in 1948, he didn't exactly know how to do it, but he knew it, it was possible. And then you transmit that through the channel, and at the receiver side, you basically undo what you did over here to deliver the output to the destination. So I'll show you a couple of examples. So one possible source of information is the English language. The letters in the English language, 26 letters plus one space. Actually, Shannon himself computed the entropy of the English language to be 2.6 bit bits per letter. Now, if you didn't know Shannon's work, you would probably think we have 27, 26 letters plus space, 27. Log of 27 is about, I don't know, 4.5, 4.6, something like that. You might think you need 4.6 bits per letter. You don't. You need a lot less. How to achieve that, we don't know, or Shannon didn't know but he knew that it's possible to do it with only 2.6 bits per letter. So it is impossible to represent the source with fewer than 2.6 bits, but it's possible to represent it with 2.6 or just a tad bigger than 2.6. Another example is this picture. I actually took this picture. I went out, took a picture of the skyline, and whoops, and that picture is this one over here. This picture is taken with my iPhone in the raw format, you probably know how to do that using your camera. In the raw format, it gives you a digital photo of 4,000 multiplied by 3,000 pixels, 4,000 in this direction, 3,000 in this direction. Each pixel is 12 bits. So in order to store this picture, you need 24 megabytes if you don't do anything smart. But Shannon said there are smart ways to do this. You don't need to be dumb. So. Actually, I took that same picture and I used an algorithm, which we may talk about later, to losslessly encode and then decode this picture. And in order to store that image, I only need 15 megabytes as opposed to 24 megabytes. So that way I can squeeze more images into the same amount of space than I would have if I didn't know about Shannon's work. Okay, so let's talk about the next notion, which is Channel capacity, again, some mathematical formula. Let's skip the mathematics of it. But the channel capacity is a mathematical characterization of the communication channel. And here is Shannon's second 
important result, which is referred to as the noisy channel coding theorem. And he proved this other totally astonishing result. He said, if the rate of information that you pump into the channel, and let's call it R, if that is less than the capacity of the channel, despite the fact that your channel is a noisy channel, it is possible to reproduce that source perfectly at the output of the channel. But if the rate is bigger than the channel capacity, it is impossible to do that. Once again, he established this incredible Shannon limit, this time related to transmission of information reliably through the channel. If your capacity is C and the rate you pump into the channel is less than C, you're going to be OK. If, if the rate is bigger than C, impossible. There is no way you can transmit it reliably. So pictorially, the source is sitting here. Its entropy is H. You know that you can have a lossless coding scheme that gives you a rate very, very close to H without any loss of information. And you can transmit that through the channel. If this R is less than C, reliable communication is possible. If R is bigger than C, reliable communication is impossible. So Shannon said, if R is less than C, we need a box over here, which we call channel encoder, and a box over here, which is called channel decoder, whose job is to take the information that shows up here and reproduce it perfectly over here. And that is possible, he proved, only if R is less than C. If R is bigger than C, impossible. So. We're getting close to the end of this, and I want you to understand the impact of his work. What Shannon did, he started with a source, a channel, a destination, and he showed through two landmark results, the noiseless source coding theorem and the noisy channel coding theorem, that the right way to communicate is to take the source, put it into a source coder, put it into the right channel encoder, and then do the reverse at the receiver side in order to do your transmission correctly. The actual job of the source encoder and decoder is to take the source of information and eliminate all statistical redundancies in it. Only transmit useful information. It's like taking a lemon and taking the juice of it and only using the juice. That's the job of the source encoder. What is the job of the channel encoder? The job of the channel encoder is exactly the reverse. The channel encoder's job is to render the transmission through the channel reliable. How do you do that? By inserting intentional statistical redundancy. You eliminate redundancy here. You insert intentional redundancy over here in order to make your communication system the ideal, perfect communication system that you want. So what did that result in? <laughs> it resulted in creating two communities of researchers that continued to work after Shannon for decades. One entire group focused on what is called source coding, and another group focused on channel coding. Source coding, and I have given you just a finite number of examples, of major developments starting from 1952 by Huffman and um, essentially culminating in 1977 or maturing in 1977. So it took about uh, 30 years from the time Shannon uh, published his first result. But universal coding is something that you use on your phones, on your computers every day, every day. Another community was the community of channel coding people. And that resulted in fundamental works that also culminated in probably the, the most powerful code that approaches the Shannon limit of capacity called turbo coding, which you use in 5G, you mentioned. 5, 5G is a beneficiary of this particular advancement. Uh, in order to wrap up, I want to go back to a question that Shannon asked 
and we talked about this question. Actually, this question. If reliable communication is not possible, what is possible? What is the best I can do? So let me go through this quickly and tell you about that work. Yep. So the unanswered question in his 1948 paper is, what if the entropy of the source is actually bigger than the channel capacity? Well, we know reliable communication in that case is not possible. All right, fine, reliable communication is not possible, but what is the best I can do anyway? Because sometimes I'm given a communication channel, I have a source, I want to do my best to transmit this source through this channel. I may not want, I may not insist to reproduce it perfectly at the other end, but what is the best, what is the closest I can come to perfectly? Shannon defined the notion of a rate distortion function. In this case, I have avoided even writing down the mathematical equation for it. But essentially, it's in the form of a function. On the vertical axis, you measure the rate. On the horizontal axis, the amount of distortion that you'll have to suffer from. <clears throat> and in simple terms, if the capacity of the channel is bigger than the entropy of the source, if C is bigger than H, we know error-free communication is possible, no problem. If not, if the capacity is lower than H, we know that perfect communication is not possible, but what is possible is answered through this graph. You look at the point at which capacity C intersects with this graph, there is a corresponding D star. That D star is the minimum amount of information you will have to suffer from if perfect communication is not possible. So Shannon actually answered that question perfectly, beautifully, precisely. D star is exactly the amount of information that you need to suffer from. That's the best you could do. You cannot do better than D star. So I wanted to give you an example. Remember this picture? This picture was originally 24.4 megabytes. Now I showed you in a previous slide that actually it's possible to losslessly encode this picture with only 15 megabytes. So you compress the picture by approximately a factor of 1.5, all right? But you can't compress it much more than that. However, if you're willing to pay a price, if you don't insist on perfect reproduction, you can compress more and you pay a price. Well, I tell you what I've done. Using one of the techniques that all of you use every day called JPEG, I compressed the very same image 175 times. I compressed it down to only 139 kilobytes. And how many of you can tell the difference between this and that? These two are very different, by the way, dramatically different. But the human eye is not able to see the difference. Just the same way that the music of uh, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart is compressed about 100 times on your iTunes, and you listen to it, and you enjoy every second of it without knowing that this is not exactly what was produced at the uh, uh, microphone in the, in the studio. Uh, where the recording took place. The human ear is unable to hear it. The human eye is unable to see the difference. Now, I can, I can do a lot more compression, and at some point you will begin to see in a very vivid way the difference between this image and that image. But at this point, with a compression ratio of 175, you're not able to see it. So you're using these types of compressions every day in everything that you do on your computers or on your uh, mobile phones. So let me wrap it up. The result of this work, which uh, enables lossy source coding as opposed to lossless source coding, also resulted in a plethora of activities that started immediately after Shannon published his 1959 paper and continued even to this day it continues, but uh, the field is becoming pretty mature. 
And this slide over here essentially captures the essence of <clears throat> the impact. Uh, Shannon's work is being used in file compression. Uh, how many of you are familiar with what is called uh, zip files? Almost everybody in the room. You use that all the time. That's, that was originally developed by two brilliant mathematicians by the name of Lempel and Zip. Uh, if you take a compact disc or a, uh, or a DVD and you take a sharp knife and you draw and you scratch your compact disc and you put it into the compact disc player, it almost always plays with no problem. Do you know why? I mean, you've really intentionally damaged the disc. And the reason is that there is a, an error uh, 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 an error correcting code called Reed Solomon code that is part of the channel coding scheme that I showed you in the previous diagram that actually detects those errors that you intentionally create and corrects for them. Uh, any kind of uh, 3G, 4G, or LTE uh, wireless uh, telephony uses tuba codes that I talked about. Um, you use JPEG every day in transmitting still images. Um, MP3 uses what is called uh, subband audio coding. And every time that you enjoy uh, Caitlin Clark on your uh, TV screens watching uh, a nice basketball game, uh, there is a tremendous amount of uh, motion compensa compensated video coding that is a direct result of the work that Shannon did in 1959. So this is the influence of this one man on the way we live. And you haven't heard anything about quantum computing yet. You haven't heard anything about artificial intelligence. And you'll be hearing those from my, my wonderful colleagues in a, a few minutes. So let me conclude. We started with this very simple diagram, a source whose output needs to be uh, reproduced at the destination. And Shannon basically said how to transmit the information from the source into the destination. He created these communities of researchers that worked on the actual implementation of ideas that he established in 48 and 59. And I do want to say that <clears throat> a number of prominent information theorists have suggested that if it wasn't for this one person, probably the work that happened, probably all these inventions all these uh, significant developments would have been delayed possibly by several decades. And equally importantly, this beautiful uh, integrated theory that uh, brought all the pieces together would have never been developed in one piece. It would have, it would have come about in a piecemeal fashion. So I have used up my time uh, and I have reached the concluding slide, I will uh, step down. I will then join my colleagues at the panel. And if there are any questions, I, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you all very much. All right, so uh, my name is John Horgan. I'm uh, director of the Center for Science Writing here at Stevens. And uh, I've been a science journalist for about uh, 40 years now. And I, I want, first of all, to thank uh, Marianne and Nariman for giving that great overview of Shannon's work. I've got to say, Nariman, I mean, not to flatter the president of the university, but uh, that was really great. I'm an English major. Thank you so much. And I've actually spent a lot of time trying to understand Shannon's work, and that was the best overview that I've heard, and it, it sort of stretched my capacity, the, the knowledge that I already have, but in a really good way. So thank you very much for that. And thanks to the organizers of this event for letting me be part of it. Um, so my job is to uh, moderate a panel discussion now of Shannon's work. And I've, I've got two actual experts uh, with me who haven't spoken yet. Um, that's Igor Pekovsky, uh, who is a professor of theoretical quantum physics here at Stevens, and also Brendan Englot right here, uh, 
He is the director of the Institute for Artificial in Intelligence. So the plan is that we're going to chat for a while. I'm going to say a little something right now, and then uh, Brendan will speak, and then Igor, and then I will ask them some questions that uh, Naraman and Marianne might also answer. Um, so that's how it's supposed to work. But I'd like to start things off just by reminiscing a little bit about Shannon. So I was an English major and then went to journalism school and decided I, I wanted to, um, to be a science journalist, to specialize in that. And uh, I didn't hear about this person named Claude Shannon and information theory until the, the mid-1980s. This was at my first job. I, I worked at IEEE Spectrum right out of uh, graduate school in journalism. And of course, within the IEEE, Shannon is this uh, titan. And when I learned about this person whose work had laid the foundation for digital technologies, I thought, why haven't I heard about this person before? Why haven't I heard about Shannon or about information theory before? And um, information theory already by that time was hugely influential, not only in digital technology, but it had kind of seep out, seeped out into all these other uh, disciplines right now. It continues to be extraordinarily influential. Again, not just in the sphere for which it was invented. Information theory is really big in, in physics. I think Igor is going to talk about, uh, about that. And um, it's even big in fields like neuroscience. So neuroscientists are really interested in understanding how conscious states are produced by matter and especially by brains. The leading, most famous theory of conscious right now, consciousness right now is called integrated information theory. Now, the people who are responsible for that theory have said that they've tried to tweak the concept of information for their purposes, but still, the theory was clearly influenced by, uh, by Shannon's theory. Um, but Shannon remains largely unknown, so why is that? And I'm going to try to give an answer to that based on this meeting that I had with him. Um, I met him in 1989. By this time, I was a staff writer for Scientific American Magazine, and I thought it would be great to interview this guy and uh, write a profile of him for Scientific American. So I tracked him down to uh, his home in North Boston. He had retired from MIT uh, by then, and he agreed to see me, to let me come up and, um, and visit him. And uh, so I, I arrived at his house, and he and his wife, Betty, who also was a very accomplished mathematician, were both there. And um, I had all these questions prepared about Shannon's uh, career, his technical work. And um, he actually wasn't that interested in answering my questions about about his career, about his technical accomplishments. Uh, the sense that I got from him was that he was, he was very shy. He was very modest and, uh, and self-deprecating. So I had all these questions about um, Boolean algebra, his famous master's uh, thesis, as well as about the origins of, of information theory and how that was inspired by his work on, uh, on encryption at uh, at Bell Labs, and a lot of these questions Betty ended, ended up answering for him. And she was actually better on the details uh, than he was. It was also because he just didn't, he didn't want to brag about all the things he'd done. What he wanted to do was to show me all his gadgets. So Nariman has mentioned uh, some of the things that he invented, uh, Theseus, the maze navigating uh, mouse, and uh, the W.C. Fields uh, juggling mannequin. So it turned out that all these gadgets were in a, a room in uh, Shannon's house. And he kept, when we, we'd be talking about, again, about some aspect of information theory, he'd keep jumping up and dragging me off to show me this room and uh, demonstrate his gadgets. 
He was really concerned with getting the W.C. Fields mannequin to work. Sadly, it did not. A lot of these, a lot of the gadgets in the room, to be honest, look like they were in uh, disrepair. Um, Shannon had a kind of mischievous smile and a goofy sense of, of humor. I remember that at one point I was asking him about Boolean algebra and how he used it to come up with a method for circuit design. And he said, I've always loved that word, Boolean. <laughs> this is typical of the way he would kind of deflect my questions uh, with humor. Um, he was very opinionated. So I remember at one point I asked him whether he thought machines can think as Alan Turing famously suggested in a 1950 paper. And Shannon's response was, quote, you bet. I'm a machine, and you're a machine, and we both think, don't we? <laughs> Shannon added, by the way, and this, remember, this is 1989. It is certainly plausible to me that in a few decades, machines will be beyond humans, unquote. As Nariman mentioned, Shannon uh, loved juggling. Um, that's why he wanted to show me the WC Fields mannequin. There were also other juggling devices in, um, in this room, room filled with gadgets. What you may not know, what uh, Nariman did not mention, is that Shannon also invented a uh, unified theory of juggling. And if you want to see what this is, I can't remember it off the top of my head, but I posted it in a profile of Shannon that you can find just by Googling my name and Claude Shannon. Shannon had this kind of, and this is something that a lot of co his colleagues had told me uh, about him before I interviewed him. He had this kind of playful, childlike quality. And apparently, Bell Labs was happy to indulge this side of him. Uh, when I asked him about his relationship with uh, Bell Labs and whether they allowed him to do whatever he wanted, he said, absolutely. And this is a direct quote. I've always pursued my interests without much regard for value to the world. Mm -hmm. I've spent lots of time on totally useless things. And he said this proudly. And, um, and when he talked about moving beyond information theory in the 1960s, which is, which is what he did, he contributed very little to the field. I was told by colleagues after that, if he did work on it, he didn't publish. But that's because he was interested in other things. He was interested in uh, building some of these devices that now we recognize as being uh, very important to the origins of artificial intelligence. So I'd like to end my, these remarks with one story about Shannon, and it actually has to do with the, the meeting at which Nariman met him in 1985. So I, I had been talking before I met Shannon to some of his uh, colleagues, and one had been at that meeting in Brighton, England in 1985. And, um, and Shannon had showed up by, uh, by surprise, and some of the organizers thought, oh my God, we've got to get him to say something at the banquet. But it turned out that, and again, this was something that Shannon's colleagues and friends had told me, he had horrible stage fright, terrible stage fright. So he did not, and you have to tell me if you remember this, um, but what I was told is that he said a few remarks at the banquet, but he really didn't want to. And so then he stopped talking and pulled balls out of his pockets and juggled for everybody. And everybody cheered wildly, and then they started lining up for autographs. And the person who had witnessed this told me afterwards that it was as if Newton had showed up at a physics conference. Everybody revered him to that extent. So again, the question is, why don't we know more about this guy. I mean, here I am at a tech school. I constantly ask my students if they've heard of Claude Shannon. None of them have heard of Claude Shannon. And I think it's because Shannon was just 
not a self-promoter at all. He was very shy and modest. He loved his work, but he didn't like uh, bragging about it. Um, if social media had been available in the 60s or 70s, I doubt Shannon would have been promoting himself on TikTok or Instagram or whatever. So I'm really thrilled that, um, that I, Rosenbach uh, had, had the idea of, uh, of having this event because it's really a good thing that we're drawing attention to Quad Shannon. All right, so now I would like to um, turn things over first to Professor Englitt, who's right here, and uh, then Bukowski. Okay. Go ahead. Thanks, John. So uh, I, I'd like to offer some perspective on uh, Shannon's contributions to artificial intelligence, which uh, maybe are more uh, clear in hindsight that, oh, yes, let me do that, sorry. Uh, uh, so yeah, I'd like to talk a bit about Shannon's contributions to artificial intelligence, which are probably clearer today in hindsight now that we've, we've seen the ways that uh, AI is, is changing our, our world. Um, I guess one of the most maybe remarkable things about his early contributions were his insight into the potential for non-numerical computing, uh, you know, thinking about the time at which he did his master's work, 1937, um, just the idea of using computers for non-numerical computation is kind of uh, revolutionary. Uh, especially given how few computers were in existence and how most of his ideas were just, you know, theoretical ideas about what you could do with a computer. Um, so, you know, maybe the most impactful outcome of his 1937 thesis was, uh, you know, the digital circuit design that, that helped, um, you know, result from it. But just in general, the idea of, uh, you know, thinking about analog circuits as a vehicle for, um, performing logical computation and logical reasoning. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's some of the foundational ideas that have led to what we do today, trying to build machines that think. And, you know, he, uh, I mean, that, was, that was his perspective on what machines could do as well. Um, I think that's also realized in the, uh, the work that he published on algorithms for playing chess. And the fact that not, not only could you um, implement this with a hypothetical computer, uh, it, you know, it, when he proposed this in 1950, he also had the idea that the algorithm could improve its performance, um, that every time it played a game of chess, you could update the coefficients used by this algorithm uh, to improve your play. Um, now, he couldn't actually demonstrate this in 1950, but uh, a few years later, a scientist at IBM used the same idea to implement algorithms for uh, playing checkers and improving their performance, uh, Arthur Samuel. And in 1959, the paper that he published about that is uh, arguably the first use of the term machine learning in print. Uh, and that was inspired by Shannon's idea uh, about how an algorithm could learn to improve how it plays chess. Um, so just some really exciting foundational contributions to non-numerical computing. And uh, another, maybe one of the most famous now, you know, in, in hindsight, um, contributions that he made to AI was his co-authorship on the seminal proposal for the Dartmouth Summer Research Project in Artificial Intelligence, which was a, a very important event that happened in 1956, where some of the key foundational thinkers on AI got together and had probably the most famous brainstorming session that occurred on artificial intelligence to kind of set the agenda for the next several decades of research in AI. Uh, so Shannon was one of the four proposers of that workshop. Um, and I think it's kind of insightful to go back and see how he described himself, uh, you know, as one of the proposers of that workshop. Um, his biography in that proposal says that he developed the statistical theory of information, as we heard about today. Uh, the application of propositional calculus to switching circuits, his famous master's thesis. And he also has results on the efficient synthesis of switching circuits, the design of machines that learn. Again, that idea being thrown around in 1955 when uh, this was written is, is prescient and revolutionary. Um, cryptography and the theory of Turing machines. And uh, so he really was one of the pioneers of artificial intelligence being part of that, that seminal workshop where many of the, you know, much of the key agenda was formulated that would dictate 
AI research for, for a long time to come. Uh, beyond that, you know, the work in information theory that we heard about today also has modern, uh, you know, mo modern intersections with AI, and I think a lot of the, the foundational principles he laid down also help to kind of set the limits for the AI-enhanced versions of that work that we see today in AI-enhanced uh, compression and channel coding and denoising. Um, and then maybe the last thing worth mentioning that uh, affects my own work, it's kind of at the intersection of AI and robotics, is in robotics and autonomy, we actually use Shannon's entropy quite a lot to aid uh, robot decision making in terms of how does an autonomous vehicle make decisions about how to reason and explore and map an unknown environment? Well, we actually use uh, Shannon's entropy as a guiding principle for that, and it could be a very efficient way to guide decision making when you know very little about the environment and you're trying to discover it along the way. So uh, Shannon is definitely a, you know, a, a key contributor to AI and it's exciting to see the different ways his early thinking on uh, computation have you know, had an impact today. Thanks. Igor. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so let me m maybe uh, add a little bit of a physics perspective to Shannon's work as well. And I'll uh, start with a few brief remarks. Um, so Shannon's work has been, you know, very profoundly impactful actually of modern, for modern physics. Uh, and it's a bit surprising because there's absolutely no physics in Shannon's work at all. And that's the beauty of it. Uh, so it's very generic. It's very general. He's just talking about information and doesn't care so much about what actually carries this information. Um, but physicists can't help themselves, so they jumped on this work as well and started adding a little bit of physics to it. Now, why do you need some of the physics? Um, and that's where quantum physics comes into play. Uh, in Shannon's work, uh, he talks about how well we can transmit information, how we can encode it, but information carriers themselves are perfect. They have, uh, we can retrieve information from them if you want, and they can encode uh, information up to some capacity. Now, for physicists, this was very interesting because it was the first instance, or one of the first instances, where the notion of entropy played a crucial role outside of physics. And so they started paying a little bit of attention. And one of the things they noticed is that, well, in physics, we have now quantum laws of physics. And one of the issues they have is there is the uncertainty principle. And what it does is it limits the amount of information we can actually retrieve from a system. That's what the famous Heisenberg uncertainty principle really tells us, and I'm sure you all heard about it in some form. You know, if you measure one thing to perfect precision, there is some other thing that we don't know anything about. And we can choose, but there's always a trade-off. And so that's where they started to start to study. Namely, well, if our information carriers obey the laws of quantum physics, and at some level they must, you know, atoms at some point, um, what are actually the limitations uh, to Shannon's result? So that was the thinking how it started. But it started a huge revolution where it went into completely different uh, uh, directions. Let me, let me just give a couple of remarks and guide you a little bit through it. So the early thought was that quantum mechanics will impose li uh, limitations. So that Shannon is the best thing you can do, but there will be some practical noisy limitations because of the uncertainty principle. Uh, what's a little bit interesting is 1970, they started to be the first speculation that maybe there's something more than that. Maybe quantum physics can help. That was by Wiesner. He submitted a paper on that 1970 to IEEE, one of the IEEE papers. It was rejected. It's considered nonsense. Uh, his idea was that, well, if you limit information, sometimes that actually is useful. Namely for cryptography, for example. Sometimes you want to limit the amount of information. And it was a little first hint that maybe there is something about quantum theory that we could use. But it was still very, very early. And so uh, uh, one big question for physicists then at that time was how do you generalize Shannon's theories, Shannon's ideas, uh, to include the quantum framework? So the one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to add too much physics into it. Because again, Shannon's work is so general and that's the beauty of it, that there's no physics, that you just want to talk about information and not so much if it's a compact disk or MP3 or whatever, whatever in, uh, uh, implementation it is, it will still obey these rules. Um, and so that took a little while. And then what people did is what you do is you incorporate just the math of quantum physics and not really the details of atoms or electrons or something like that. So you really keep the abstraction and you just add this mathematical framework. 
Um, and that was done using also another uh, genius ideas of mostly von Neumann, who, who, who created the beautiful mathematical framework as we use today for, um, uh, for quantum theory. And uh, Shannon's ideas were generalized uh, to be talking in terms of this new mathematical framework. So instead of entropy, now we use, uh, instead of Shannon entropy, we use von Neumann entropy and so forth. But there's a one-to-one -one correspondence, but now there's a new mathematical framework. Okay, and the beauty of that is that there's a lot of it in it, uh, a lot uh, that people don't expect. We just have a new framework. Um, and in particular, there was some notion that we had to generalize channel capacity. Uh, so uh, another one talked about um, how much information can we transmit through a channel. This new mathematical framework that is now built on quantum math had Shannon capacity as a special case. Uh, so we could have like a classical uh, channel capacity, which is the usual Shannon one. And then there's this more broader uh, quantum states that have this uncertainty principle. And so usually it makes things worse. Okay, so there's like this quantum channel capacity, usually it's worse than the classical. So, so far so good, it's a little bit of what we expected. It all felt like a little bit academic, but you know, let's, let's find out what happens. And then there is something very remarkable that happened. There was very big surprises that starting to pop up uh, once we had the mathematical framework for it. Uh, and uh, very few people realized it, but it was a very mysterious thing. Uh, let me give you a very brief example for that. Namely, if we, had, if we have two channels, and they have some classical channel capacity. What turns out that in this quantum framework, if they add them together, you can suddenly transmit more information than the sum of each of mm. them. And that's something that's impossible. You can mathematically prove it's impossible within Shannon's framework, within normal information theory. So we have two channels, and then the amount of information we can transmit is more than the sum of them. And there's even an extreme example of that. We can have two quantum channels, so they just, uh, you know, there's only quantum states in them, uh, and they have zero information capacity. There's absolutely nothing you can transmit through them. Zero. Both of them. Absolutely nothing. And yet you put them together, and jointly, they can transmit information. Mm. So individually zero, and together <clears throat> they can transmit information. And especially when you dive deeper into that, it is... It is not possible. You can try to find, well, what, what, what's, what's the loophole? What's the trick here? And then you realize after a while, there's no loophole. There's no trick. It's just the math doesn't, you know, it just doesn't work. It's not logical. It's not possible. In classical physics, it's not possible. There's very few people that realize that. And so it was really, again, one of those cases where in the 70s, 80s, nobody was paying attention. Very, very few people like David Deutsch and, you know, Peter Schwartz started thinking about it. Um, and so there is a lot of results that came kind of under, you know, even most physicists didn't pay attention. And that eventually led to quantum cryptography, quantum sensing, quantum computing, what we know today. So it was, uh, you know, uh, the starting point uh, of really our modern quantum revolution, where it turns out you can do certain things uh, better uh, with quantum physics than without. But it's a very, very, very subtle effect. Okay, and so now there is a... Uh, of course, the question is, how does, uh, how does it work? Uh, how exactly does, th does this happen? And one of the tricks of quantum physics that it uses is what we know as quantum entanglement. Okay, so you might have heard about it. It's this kind of mysterious thing that people call spooky action at a distance, uh, quantum entanglement. And then maybe in the, uh, do I still have two minutes? Oh, you're, you're, yeah. Okay, that's you're good. Okay. Then maybe in the last two minutes, let me try to uh, demonstrate that with even a little bit less math than, uh, uh, than <laughs> President Favarden used uh, to demonstrate um, Shannon's work. So entanglement is at the core that allows you to transmit in some sense or be able to work with more information than it's possible in classical physics. Okay, so let me try to demonstrate it with this. Let's see, does this work? Can you hear that? Can you see it? All right, so uh, my son has a lot of trains. So I'll, uh, I borrowed one, okay? So I'm gonna show you this one. Now he has, as I mentioned, a lot of trains, so I have a second train here as well. Now you can notice there is a difference between those two, okay? One is white and the other one is blue, okay? And now there's a very simple protocol we can do and we can talk about it in terms of information in a very, very simple form, okay? I'm just gonna hide those uh, in these two baskets Okay, I'm gonna place one in each basket. I'm not gonna tell you which is which. 
Okay, and now you need to find out what's in the other basket, okay? And you can do that just by looking only into this one, all right? So uh, it's not so complicated. So what do you see? All right, so what's in the other basket? A white one. So you know instantaneously what's in the other basket. It could be on Mars, could be anywhere you want. You have instantaneous information update. And so this so-called spooky action at a distance in this case is completely trivial within the notion of information. It is just an update of information. There's nothing magical happening here. Okay, you look at one and you know instantaneously what's happening in the other. Now these are obviously classical uh, uh, trains, okay? So now let me try to make them quantum. So my son also has a lot of cars, okay? So he has a lot of cars, a lot of trains. You can see I have also now two cars and they are white and blue, okay? Now we have uh, several pairs. Now here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take just uh, two of those things. Okay, so we have two trains, two cars, uh, one blue and one white each, okay. So I'm gonna take two of those, I'll just make a pair and place one in this basket and another in the other basket, okay? All right, so uh, now ask me questions about this item here and try to deduce what's in the other one. Okay, who wants to go first? Yes? Are they both the same color? Um, oh, well, we know, well, we know that they're always uh, the different color. So we know that. So we know one is, one is white, one is blue, and one is a, a, a car and one is a, a train. Okay, so, so sorry, I forgot to tell you that. So you have these pairs. One is white, one is blue, one is a car, one is a train. So okay? The question was, are both objects in the basket? They're in a basket, right. Well, so we have, I have one pair, sorry, let me clarify. I have one pair here. We're just gonna find out whatever is here. You'll know exactly whatever is in the other one. The rule that the car is always paired with the train. Right, the car is always paired with the train and the colors, right. So there's exactly, yeah. So there's this, right, exactly, thank you. So now, um, exactly, so now the question is, what, uh, what can you ask about this, uh, uh, this system here? Yes. Is that what, uh, well, let's, let's start with one question, okay? Is it white? Okay, uh, let me say yes, it's white. So what's in the other basket? Blue, okay. Now what's the second question you can ask? Is it a car? Yes, it's a car. So what's in the other one? Blue train, all right, let me, let me show you. Well, it turns out it's a white train. Now, if you had normal classical systems, that's completely impossible. That's completely impossible because you perfectly specified, you had only two systems, you perfectly specified uh, what they are and it must be perfectly correlated. But here, what, uh, uh, well, of course I was cheating, obviously, so I just didn't have it in this basket and I had it in the other basket. But quantum mechanics does that without cheating. So you can change properties on the other side in very, very subtle ways by making measurements on one side. And the subtlety is a combination of correlating things, which is not a problem classically. You can correlate things like you showed before, and, but you also combine it with randomness. So quantum mechanics also has this uncertainty principle. And so what happens here is that when you make measurements, uh, then you could make things appear completely random on the other side. And you only notice when you start correlating things. So this is at the heart of quantum information in many ways, which is you know, now a little bit less math. Um, but what it does, it allows us to think about very fundamental quantum concepts, even without much math, in fact. Uh, and really without the Schrodinger equation, without all these complicated things, just in terms of the notion of information and how things are correlated. And that has been extremely powerful, not only to devise new uh, technologies based on some very subtle phenomena, but also to even understand quantum mechanics better, to even try to understand what it actually means. Okay, with that, yeah, let me finish here. So I was thinking of Richard Feynman's famous comment that if you think you understand quantum mechanics, you don't. <laughs> anyway, thanks. That, that was, 
That was great. It's one of those topics that my experience has been, the more I try to understand it, the more confused I get. Um, thank you both. I, so here's, here's a question I'd like to throw out. Um, I had, I mentioned that uh, this colleague of Shannon's uh, compared him to Newton. And my question for uh, Igor and Brendan or anybody is whether we could expect an Einstein of information theory to come along who really transcends Shannon's work and maybe blows past some of the limits that Shannon established. In other words, is Shannon in some sense an endpoint or possibly the beginning of some even more revolutionary way of understanding the coding, um, computing, and communication of information? Well, my domain is still kind of uh, conventional computing, so I, uh, I can't comment on the, the potential future transformations that might be possible should quantum computing and quantum AI become realized toward, the, toward these ends. But at least as of today, you know, his, his work still guides the work of people working at the intersection of AI and information theory who are trying to do AI-enhanced uh, you know, compression and denoising and channel coding. So not yet, it doesn't seem, at least within the realm of conventional computing, but I'll defer to others on what might be possible in the future. I mean, is it possible the work you're talking about is exactly what I'm referring to as a revolutionary, that, that quantum mechanics represents a revolutionary way to reconceive information theory? Yeah, in some sense, I think it goes in this direction. So maybe my outlook is a bit more positive. I, I think it's a good example in the sense that Shannon really laid out the groundwork of how to think things in novel ways. And, you know, between Newton and Einstein, it was, uh, you know, 200 years, uh, and we thought things work well. Um, but so I think, I, yeah, I would not be surprised if something similar would happen. In many ways, you might then start discovering information theory or maybe some relevance of it in other domains, like you already said, maybe in biology, maybe in some, I don't know, quantum gravity, it could be so many different fields where uh, you then really need to go back to the basics of kind of Shannon theory and other aspects. And then, yeah, quantum theory does generalize it a little bit, uh, but I think there's probably a lot of room uh, for new discoveries. But just as with Newton, he laid out a kind of a framework of how to think about it. And then you can really start, you know, asking these questions. So yeah, I, th I think it's likely there will be the next big revolution kind of um, generalizing it even further. So in other words, I guess the question is, is the, is the Shannon limit absolute or can it be transcended? The way you were talking about harnessing entanglement sounded like it might be a way to go past the conventional Shannon limit. Yeah, but in subtle ways. So kind of it's by combining channels and then kind of correlating them in, in, in clever ways. So this is what entanglement does. And then you can, you know, surpass these limits in a subtle ways, not channel by channel, but kind of jointly, like this additivity of them. Yeah, so it's it's a subtle way of generalizing it. Um, but it could very well be that, yeah, beyond that, maybe there is some, uh, something more. But again, Newton is still true, kind of uh, Einstein, you know, more general. Newton is still true in its own limit. Exactly. And so that, that might still be the case. I think that will be the case for Shannon. It's so fundamental. It just might be that kind of there's a more broader framework. So I, I guess I've been having conversations with physicists lately who've been using information in various ways. And I'm, I'm puzzled about one aspect of it. They seem to see information as something strictly physical. Whereas, of course, it was invented, information theory was invented as a mode of communication. But um, Leonard Susskind, for example, uh, a big shot physicist at, at Stanford, his talk about information being strictly physical and information is something that's conserved. You don't need any uh, recipient of information or a sender of information. You don't need any sentient beings anywhere in your system to talk about uh, the system being composed of information. So I just wonder if you have any comments on that. Yeah, yeah, I think that's precisely the viewpoint that kind of Shannon's work opened, that you can 
change the perspective of how we even think about the physical world instead of particles or trajectories or you know these kind of things that we can grasp and we can usually uh, define and then build physics around instead around the concept of information how much do we actually know about the world how much do measurements reveal and, and so forth and that really helped a tremendous amount for physics to advance I think that's uh, that's certainly true so I maybe I wouldn't call it that information itself is physical that's kind of again uh, maybe a bit of a Physicists can't help themselves. They kind of have to inject physics in it. But I would maybe uh, turn it around, namely that there's a kind of a, a much broader and, and rich way to think about the physical world uh, in terms of information, and that helps uh, gain a new understanding. And I think that has certainly been the case, with, you know, quantum technology being one example. So one of the interesting things that Shannon said, he was trying to get me to understand the concept of information. And he said that he thought of it, the, the information in a system, the potential information, as uh, the, the system's capacity to surprise uh, someone on the outside. And that, that phrase, to me, again, suggested consciousness somehow. I, I'm, what I'm alluding to is also this idea in quantum theory that that you can't look at things as strictly physical, that there's an observer as part of the system that determines the outcome of experiments and, and that sort of thing. So I'm just throwing this idea out there because it's one of my philosophical obsessions. Do these foundational theories somehow require something sentient in them? I mean, there's a lot of debate about that. It has been for 100 years, certainly. But I think there, again, Shannon helped guide it at least a big portion of us, I would say, in terms of information, that namely, the clear answer there would be no. That, you know, if we talk about information, we do not need to talk about who's reading it, why, what are they thinking about it. It's just, you know, there's a bit or there's a qubit or something like that uh, of information of something. And what is actually done with it, uh, or, you know, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. So, so it's a way to abstract away also kind of consciousness if one wants but of course there's still a lot of subtle philosophical questions but it did help quantum physics precisely in that regard that one needed to stop thinking about who's doing the measurement and why and where do we stop uh, you know you could just think about how much information content is there kind of localized in some area and, and does it leak out somewhere else and it doesn't matter if you know if there's people observing it or not so um and by the way, the, you were all free to ask each other questions as well, but I, I've got a bunch more. Um, Brendan, your field, artificial intelligence, to what degree is it keeping an eye on what these quantum information theorists are doing? Is that seen yet as work that might really enhance artificial intelligence? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, there, you know, artificial intelligence is pushing the physical limits of, you know, what we can compute and the, you know, the resources we need to, uh, uh, to build the, the, the very demanding models that, that we have in AI today. So I think we're, we're looking to other branches of science to physics for the next revolution that's going to make, uh, make that possible, maybe at a more sustainable scale, uh, just because, you know, today's, uh, the scale required to, to, to do today's computing, to, uh, to build and to query and to train state-of-the-art generative AI models, I mean, it consumes so much energy and space and resources and, ha and also still requires so, so much human resources as well to make those models possible. So uh, there, there is, I think, future, very promising future prospects for how uh, you know, AI and quantum computing and uh, algorithms that could be enhanced through quantum computing um, might be able to change that field and make it more sustainable. So is there, is there a lot of room left before you reach the Shannon limit in the way that you construct algorithms for artificial intelligence? Mm -hmm. um, I guess, uh, it depends. Uh, you know, not not every aspect of uh, artificial intelligence looks at things through the lens of Shannon. I guess it's it has it has proven to be very useful in 
modern enhancements to all of the uh, algorithms that President Farvardin spoke about, but uh, there's just a, a much broader perspective on AI as well. And I think probably Shannon would have a lot to say about it too. Uh, and you, you may be able, I think he would have a lot to say about it beyond the lens of information theory. So another question I have, um, Nariman, you, you alluded to, uh, you basically said that without Shannon, it would have taken a lot longer to have this kind of language for um, talking about and quantifying information. And I guess I, I'm, I'll ask you and, uh, and Marianne, the, the historian, whether how irreplaceable Shannon was, um, how different the world would be scientifically, uh, technologically, if Shannon had never existed. In other words, just as a point of comparison, the double helix as, uh, as uh, a way of coding biological information. There are a lot of scientists who are after that. And Francis Crick and James Watson were undoubtedly brilliant. But the thinking is that somebody would have gotten there pretty quickly, maybe Linus Pauling or someone else. So how unusual, and this has to do with Shannon's genius, how unusual and prescient was he in putting <clears throat> together this framework? Uh, <clears throat> I'll, I'll make some uh, remarks, and uh, Marianne, please feel free to offer your thoughts. Uh, <clears throat> I think in response to the question of the role Shannon played in making engineers and mathematicians and scientists think differently at the time, he played a pivotal role, a unique role, a very unusual role. Nobody else at that time in the world was prepared to speak in the words that Shannon spoke. Uh, <clears throat> at that time in the 1940s, uh, when Shannon began to think about the mathematical theory of communication uh, that was published in 1948, people were thinking about a source of information as deterministic. You have a deterministic signal that needs to be transmitted from point A to point B. Shannon is the person who started thinking about these things as a probabilistic model. That is a revolutionary way of thinking. Secondly, <clears throat> in those days, sources of information were essentially of an analog nature. The output of a microphone, the output uh, of a video camera, or some, something like that. Shannon is the first person who starts thinking about things in digital form, zeros and ones. This is revolutionary. So, <clears throat> and then of course he puts together this elegant theory that brings all the pieces together. So I would say his contributions are twofold. One is in a revolutionary way of approaching the problem of communication, the fundamental problem of communication. And two is putting in this elegant theory together. Had it not been for Shannon <clears throat> at that time, in my opinion, advances in communications would have happened, <clears throat> probably at a slower pace, probably in so many different directions, as opposed to a unified direction that Shannon helped develop. And in my opinion, and as I mentioned in the opinion of uh, information theorists who are much brighter than than I, uh, it would have happened piecemeal and with significant delay, both piecemeal and in significant delay. So it probably would have taken decades for us uh, <clears throat> to be able to put all the pieces together in the same elegant theory under the same elegant umbrella that Shannon uh, created. Thank you. Yep. Do you have any <clears throat> thoughts on this question? Okay. Uh, I'm going to quote from his Medal of Honor. This is the citation. For his development of a mathematical theory of communication which unified and significantly advanced the state of the art. So not quite a 
complete sentence, but so in 1966, his colleagues think that he unified, which is what we're all talking about. But as an aside, when I was talking to various people I've been recording oral histories with and working on other projects, I've got a list of people that I have to look up because they were working on similar things at the same time. Now, it's not up to me to pull all the vectors together, but it, it's, yeah, the unified part, yeah. But I'm not an expert in that precise field. So I think what he created was a synergy that then people could bounce off on. But all the loose vectors, yeah, that's probably an issue. And the fact that he could envision this and it's all invisible, it was mind-boggling, just as Newton, but there are critics now that say, or scholars now that say, Newton, other people were thinking about that. He's not the inventor of calculus or, or whatever. But I think the fact that he brought it together is extremely important, and that he built a community of like-minded people that, that he then had a node at MIT to develop it. And, you know, even the milestone talking about from 30, um, 39 to 67 for the development of this information theory is, is interesting uh, to, to have a date range. And then the last thing I'll say is the gentleman, Bishnu Attell, who worked at Bell Labs his whole career, he got into this signal processing and communication things because he was at home in India and had a terrible phone connection, and he couldn't hear his offer from Bell Labs. And so it was like a what the heck moment. This is what I want to spend my life doing. And he really liked Shannon. And I'm going back through the oral histories, and I have to hyperlink all the Shannons in it. And you'll see uh, Andrew Goldsmith and everybody else talk about the significance of Shannon in their life. And the fact that he was a quiet and not a self-promoting kind of guy, I think makes it even more special. Because he didn't say he was important. His colleagues said he was important. Those are my two cents. That's really nice. What I, what I was told also is that Shannon was ahead of his time. And so the theory that he created, the technology didn't really catch up to it for several decades. And then, of course, everything uh, Everything ex exploded. Um, so I want to open it up to uh, questions from the hey, audience. John, can I make oh, one more point sure. related to this last question that you asked, which I think the audience might uh, enjoy learning about? Uh, Shannon's paper was published in 1948, the first landmark paper. And it is not that at the time there were not some brilliant, prominent, highly accomplished mathematicians and engineers working on similar problems. There were. He shocked the community. In fact, there are papers that were published soon after 1948 by some of the most prominent figures of the time who, maybe I use this term, which is not exactly scientific, but they really tried to poo-poo Shannon's work mm. and uh, minimize the importance of what he had done, although they couldn't poke a hole in the, in the math of it, the math was solid, but the fact that Shannon had claimed to have established certain limits to them was not so important. So what is the importance of a limit? Well, sure enough, it took between 1948 and 1991 for somebody to develop a code <laughs> that almost achieved the, the limit. Uh, so <clears throat> his work was so much ahead of its time that it really surprised the community. Yeah. So, that, so his legacy is still being recognized um, belatedly today. All right, so questions from the audience. Yes, sir. So it was remarkable, uh, the, the developments that came from industrial labs like Bell Labs and from wartime efforts like the MIT Radiation Lab. And I'm curious now, without advocating for more wartime efforts, um, where do we look for enhancements and um, fundamental science developments like 
those that occurred in industrial labs or during war efforts? Wow, oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah. I'll just say that uh, by the time I interviewed Shannon, uh, Bell Labs, the old Bell Labs had broken up and uh, there were a lot of people saying that we'll never see a, a place like that again. We'll never see a place that will just hire brilliant, brilliant scientists, brilliant thinkers, and let them do whatever they want to do. That things are, especially in corporate labs, things are driven by the bottom line much more than they were uh, when Shannon was at, at Bell Labs. I'll take a crack at this. Uh, <clears throat> you're asking a very important question. Uh, I don't think there is a good answer to your question. I think uh, there's a vacuum, at least in the United States, in that we don't have an entity similar to what Bell Labs used to be. It is important to remind everybody that Shannon's work, <clears throat> uh, this important work was first published in 1948. In 1947, in the same laboratory at Murray Hill, the transistor was invented. So think about the impact that these two incredible inventions probably developed in two different floors of the same building. One in 1947, one in one, 1948. Changed the world in the way that we see it today. I don't think there is an organization in the United States where <clears throat> such type of fundamental science and technology is being worked on. And I am really worried about the future. Thank you. We share the same concern. I just want to remember that uh, Bell Labs was also where the cosmic microwave background that confirmed the Big Bang Theory was yep. discovered. Uh, so it was a place that not only was working on technology, but where fundamental science was being done with no commercial application. My uh, comment, uh, Bell Labs uh, is also one of the sites of invention for digital art which is important for the humanities initiatives here. I would point out that it wasn't only Bell Labs, certainly that's the largest one, but one of my professors, Lenny Reich, wrote a book on General Electric Labs, and, and they were demised earlier. But also we had Western Electric uh, Labs, but they did more product development instead of pure science. I think we have to probably look at the change in tax code and funding and, and how things can be written off. We have to look at inflation in the 1970s. America started to change a lot. And then also uh, the drive to give a dividend to the stockholders. I think something that's in such ingenious like Bell Labs, they started to look at what did it cost? Now, in my research, one of my other oral history projects is on the super invisible, superconductivity. And there's a whole host of laboratories associated with the Department of Energy. And these labs are scattered all over. And what I find interesting is universities and other companies contract with these labs. And so the research is so scattered. And that's one of the ingenious ways, but also you can't get your head around it. You could even look at NSF funding coming here, or are you doing something for some telecom co company? So uh, yeah, a wartime effort would probably bring them together because government money, and we could see that after 9-11 with cybersecurity. But it's really hard to figure out the what ifs. We can figure out the demise of something and the, the questions that, that, you know, would we, should we, or whatever. Others will point now and say Bell Labs was atypical. We're never going to have that again. But many of the people I talk to say, why the heck not? And some of them, the other deal is when you can make money in these spin-offs, and 
you, you know, if you're at Bell Labs, you give them your patent rights and such. So some of it has to do with the extreme amount of money that can be made with spin-off companies. So it just gives me a headache. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Maybe if I can add just only one sentence, very brief, but I, I mean, I think we all share with this story. I mean, I would just add, I think it is very important, shown with Shannon, is that to give people, some people at least, uh, you know, the ability to just do blue sky research, just do useless things. And I think that's very important, which is, um, you know, not within the context of most places. I'm Narsiman. I worked here as a professor in computer science from 81 to 88, went to Bell Labs, but I was not doing any research in Shannon's area. But my question is, uh, when Auriman talked about various coding and encoding mechanisms, uh, it looks like the limit is achieved to a cert certain extent by changing the coding and also the observables. Uh, who is the last recipient who is going to receive the information? If it is human eye or the ear, then the coding and the encoding mechanisms are different, and you can achieve better limits of the Shannon coding, uh, in my opinion. And obviously, Nariman will have his own opinion. And the other part of it is, since I did research in AI, uh, there is a whole lot of things that is happening today with chat DPT and all that. So generative AI, the question is, will that change the scheme of things in actually uh, the limits that Shannon put in earlier? And as we can see, it's next question to the other person here, he, he, well, whatever, uh, he, who talked about quantum, quantum mechanics. I don't know much about quantum mechanics because I'm not a physicist, but uh, quantum computing I have studied a little bit. It looks like quantum computing will provide avenues to change the limits that Shannon provided. Please comment on that. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll respond to the first part of the question and then my colleagues will uh, answer the other parts. You're absolutely correct about the issue of uh, <clears throat> who is the observer, who is the recipient. If you remember in the diagram that I showed, there was a source and there was a destination. And sometimes the destination is the human eye, sometimes the destination is a human ear, sometimes the destination is a lawyer, sometimes the destination is a computer. Okay, so depending on what the destination is, the criteria change. I remember just to give you a very simple example, uh, when I was an active researcher, I was working on the problem of um, <clears throat> encoding X-ray imagery. And X-ray, what is an X-ray image? An X-ray image is an image that the doctors or the radiologist looks at. They were absolutely, totally um, uh, adamant that no loss of information in encoding the X-ray is acceptable. And I kept saying, why? And the reason I was asking why is that I was able to compress that image far more without any noticeable degradation of uh, quality in the reconstructed version. And they were saying, we were dealing with the community of, uh, with the medical community. They were saying, ultimately, if you're sued, a lawyer has to be able to intervene and the lawyer will measure the actual mathematical difference between the original x-ray and the one that you reproduce. If there is any deviation, this will, be, this will not pass muster in the court. So definitely depends on the application, no question about that. Now you, maybe, uh, Brendan, you can talk about sure. generative AI. Yeah, so maybe one of the, the transformational things that generative AI is making possible is for us to consider a machine processing all of the different kind of data streams that you described and attributed to how humans process information in terms of visual imagery, audio, uh, language. Uh, you know, maybe we're, we're now at the point where we can begin to develop machines that can reason about, you know, how, how to process inputs and produce outputs 
in the forms of all of those data streams. And maybe that brings us a little closer to the possibility of a machine that can be sentient, you know, because presently the very best systems that we have are just looking at a little slice of one, you know, one type of information and receiving input and producing output in terms of just that one, one form of information. But maybe uh, very soon we'll see machines that can produce uh, they can process information in terms of many different forms of data streams that come closer to what we what we as people can do. Who had their hand up first? <laughs> Shall I, maybe I, there was still one question. I only just very brief answer. I mean, your your speculative of quantum can help. Yes, I, I, quantum certainly can help, and you can kind of maybe circumvent some of these things in very subtle ways. But a lot of re you know a lot of research on that is still out there. Uh, so it's certainly a new computational class when you use quantum systems, but um, it's still very much unknown uh, how much it can actually help and where. You, you, sir. Here you go. Here's the mic. Excuse me. Oh. <laughs> um, President Favardin mentioned in his presentation that um, Shannon had a PhD thesis that was on um, a mathematical the, the, theory the, of the algebra of, yeah, of, for genetics. And uh, I did not know that. And uh, I was wondering um, what are the contributions that Shannon made to biology and evolutionary biology? Because um, a lot of people have talked about biological organisms as information processing units. They sense the environment and they make can make decisions, and not only that, they could transmit that information to their offspring, to later generations. They encode that information and transmit. So there's a lot of information theory going on here. So I was wondering if you could talk about that theme uh, with uh, biological organisms. I, I can only uh, speak very briefly about this because uh, it is kind of perplexing that uh, Shannon abandoned his interest in uh, his own PhD work almost immediately after he completed his PhD. In fact, it is very surprising. He never published his PhD uh, dissertation. Uh, we don't exactly know why, uh, but it is definitely established that he wanted to move on and work on other problems. Um, other researchers in um, the ensuing years actually went back and uh, did a lot of work in the area of uh, information in the field of genetics. There, there are, in fact, books published on, on that topic. I'm not adequately familiar to be able to tell you anything more. But I don't know of any work that Shannon himself did, either um, as a result of his PhD dissertation or in subsequent years related to that field. I can just say that there was a period in the 70s when everybody was trying to apply information theory, and it seemed obvious that it could, uh, it could add insight to some biological questions, and it was applied in the same way that cybernetics was applied back then as a kind of meta theory that could apply to any sort of scientific problem. And it, my sense is that those just turned out to be kind of dead ends, at least back then. I'm sure that there are people using information theory in biology and genetics now. I'm not aware of it, but I just wanted to let you know that there have been these waves of enthusiasm in the past that didn't necessarily lead to anything substantial. Uh, another, yeah, next, oh, is this? Uh, hi. What are the main challenges to quantum information theory? Uh, why, why can't we model quantum uncertainty with um, channel noise? Mm. Uh, um, thanks. Yeah, these are two very different questions. Uh, so, OK. Um, uh, I would say the, the main challenge for quantum information theory, to, I mean, everybody's excited about quantum information theory now because of the prospect of kind of actually building real devices uh, that could maybe apply it. Now, I would say a big challenge for quantum information theory is to actually really outline uh, 
use cases, maybe let me put it this way. So there's very few quantum information algorithms actually known. Uh, so we, we do know quantum cryptography very well. So that's actually what really directly relates to Shannon. Uh, that we understand very well. Um, but in terms of, you know, it's still the Wild West. And there's quantum information theory in terms of algorithms. So there's like, you know, a handful of useful algorithms. Shor's algorithm being a famous one can factorize large numbers maybe one day. But other than that, very, very few. And so is that the end of it? Are they maybe hundreds more? We don't know. And so it's a very special purpose device. And what purpose is still a bit question. But there are some, of course, cases. Now, the other question you have is whether kind of quantum noise could be understood as just, uh, you know, like um, classical. Well, that's the point. Well, that's exactly what cannot be done. And we can prove that exactly in experiment and math and so forth. So the issue with quantum theory is that you have this intrinsic randomness uh, that you can, on the one hand, correlate. That's what entanglement does. But on the other hand, you can never get rid of it. And that is something that is not possible to understand in any mathematical form or probabilistic framework or anything like that. And so that's, um, that's kind of what people then you know, label, you know, there's a lack of reality and uh, things like that. There's this uh, spooky action at a distance. It is the issue that there are certain phenomena that we cannot explain just as classical noise. Yeah, uncertainty is not a problem in classical physics. Probability is not a problem. But in quantum theory, they're irreducible. Like, there's no reason for them. It's not just simply we haven't looked hard enough, and then we'll find out. These uncertainties just come out of nowhere. That's what Einstein called, like, a, God doesn't play dice, because he didn't like it, but he understood it. And it took 50 years for other people to understand it as well. And it, you know, it turns out, you know, there is, he does play dice, but, um, you know, yeah, there's still a lot of mysteries around that. But for sure, it cannot be classical. So that's, that's a big issue. Um. OK, one question from a student that, all right, yeah. And then, then it's time for lunch. Um, so I am a student. So I am definitely, I love you all, especially listening to all of you. But one thing that I think you all can relate to as you are involved in this, and as we can tell with Professor Engela and Pekowski, it's very important to understand where what Shannon's work is because it has applications as we go forwards in the future research. So what might be the best ways, like as all five of you are involved in like education, that we can go forwards and use this to teach students of like, here's this amazing fi pivotal figure in information history, and how can we use that to go forwards to make the next Shannon? I'll start. OK, I'll start. Part of our education program at the History Center reach raising engineering awareness through the conduit of history we make free curriculum inquiry units and there's this development of one on info theory and so we're working on that it'll be a while we've got eight units now but but uh, part of the problem is chunking it down and then making it applicable and then i like this uh uh, little toys here because we are always tasked with a hands-on activity. So s something like that would be useful. But yeah, I, I think explaining it to them young. But the other deal is how to get people to remember who he is. He does. He's not with a, a commercially developed product with his name on it. So people know Ford, people know uh, Bell, people know Edison. And so that's one of the challenges. But the other thing, teaching about him with all those little mechanical things, I think that will grab students' attention, and then they'll sit down, and then you could tell them the other part. So we're, we're thinking about that, but, it, but it's hard. And teaching the history of tech and science, in IEEE, they have educational activities, which is tri-engineering and some STEM stuff. So I try to tell them that we do the history of STEMI and STEMI stuff, and so that it should be there. But that's a good question. I can answer by just talking about the, my favorite aspect of Shannon's work that I like to teach, which in the context of the graduate course I teach in robotics, I love to teach about information theoretic robot mapping, where you take the world, you chunk it up into little tiny grid cells. Each one of those contains information. You don't know the contents of it. And uh, you, as a robot, try to decide where to go next by determining which sensor view will uncover the largest amount of information 
and reduce entropy to the maximum extent. And it's always kind of fun making the analogy of uh, the cells of a map, which can be applied in any context, even to aerial drones or self-driving cars, uh, using the very simple uh, models that, that Shannon devised many decades ago. So hopefully that inspires some students to follow in his footsteps. The, the bad news is that the time for this session has come to a close. Um, the good news is that all the speakers and panelists will be having lunch, and I hope you'll join them and take the opportunity to continue the questions and conversation. Um, please uh, help me um, thank the speakers and the panelists for preparing and offering a stimulating uh, program. I also want to take uh, this opportunity to thank my colleagues um, at Stevens who helped make this program um, work, uh, from the Office of the President, from University Events, from University Relations, and the Division of IT. So thank you all very much for all the work that <laughs> Lunch awaits upstairs. You can take the elevator back, or, or the stairwell, um, back up to the main floor. There's a buffet lunch and table, round tables that will accommodate everyone. So whether you registered for lunch or not, please feel free to join and continue the conversation. Thank you for coming.